Hey folks, Dr. Mai here for Renaissance Periodization. What is the best caloric deficit for maximum fat loss while minimizing muscle loss? Well, I'm glad you asked because I wrote a whole video about it. We are going to use a concept from hypertrophy training called the stimulus to fatigue ratio. In hypertrophy training, the stimulus to fatigue ratio is something that attempts to catalog how much muscle growth stimulus a given exercise, for example, elicits and versus how much fatigue that it causes as a side effect as well. Because if you have the most muscle growth stimulus with the least amount of fatigue, you actually grow the most over the long term, and thus it's the best exercise or technique or set and rep scheme, whatever SFR you're measuring up. In hypertrophy training, we proxy the stimulus to fatigue ratio by essentially doing some shorthand and some very estimating type of things and getting some proxies together for what a stimulus would look like and what fatigue would look like. So for example, any given exercise or set of rep scheme, whatever, we proxy the stimulus by seeing how big of a pump does it get you per unit volume? Do you have a lot of a really good mind-muscle connection? That is, do you have crazy high tension in the muscle when you're doing the exercise or does the muscle burn a ton at higher reps or maybe not? how perturbed the muscle is, how much perturbation occurs. Like, is it super weak afterwards? Is it weird coordination? You can't brush your teeth after bicep curls. And lastly, what is the degree of disruption? Like, is the muscle super sore? Is it super tight? Is it super inflexible? Like something fucking happened to it that probably means some growth is in order. On the fatigue side, we have joint and connective tissue pain. Duh, the more an exercise has that, the worse. Psychological fatigue, how draining it is, how annoying you find the exercise. And of course, systemic fatigue, which is you're fine after the exercise or doing the exercise, you're fine, but it causes so much systemic fatigue that it makes all the other exercises difficult. Five by 10 in the deadlift, your triceps might not be sore at all or tired at all, but your whole body's so fucked up. Maybe the deadlift doesn't have the best stimulus to fatigue ratio as a way of training your back because it interferes with the rest of the system. If your stimulus is as high as possible and your fatigue is as low as possible, that really gives us kind of the best exercise possible. And that's really cool for hypertrophy. But the SFR, stimulus to fatigue ratio, is actually a very universal concept. It is a close derivative. In fact, it is a derivative of a context-specific application of a cost-benefit analysis, which is done in like um, every other field that can be named. So we can apply the SFR to a crap load of other aspects of fitness because in fitness, we generally want to stimulate something when we're working out, and we generally want to keep fatigue as low as possible. And this is true even for things like the size of a caloric deficit. So then we can surmise there is a concept called the calorie deficit SFR, calorie deficit stimulus to fatigue ratio. What is the stimulus side? What is the fatigue side? Well, we want two things from a calorie deficit. We want to lose as much fat as possible while losing as little muscle and or performance as possible, but definitely as little muscle as possible. So the SFR of a given calorie deficit, whatever number that is, is 250 calories, it's 500 calories, it's 750 calorie deficit per day. That SFR in the numerator on the top can say the amount of fat loss per unit time that we're getting out of the deficit. And the denominator on the fatigue side is how much muscle loss we're losing, or sorry, how much muscle loss is actually occurring. Fat loss divided by muscle loss gives us a very rough idea of what a stimulus to fatigue ratio would be for a diet, particularly the size of the caloric deficit. So, for example, let's play a, do a couple of thought experiments here. If we take the fat loss deficit, the shorthand in calories that you have from what you need to what you actually provide, and we crank it down to a very conservative 250 calorie per day deficit. That means, let's say, if you need 3,000 calories, then 2,750 calories is what you end up consuming. Fat loss absolutely will occur, but very slowly. Remember, fat loss rate is the numerator. That's not a good start for our stimulus to fatigue ratio. Muscle loss isn't a big concern, so the denominator is really low, but it's definitely true to say that if we got a little bit quicker with the fat loss, we still really wouldn't risk muscle loss a whole lot. For example, is it true to say statistically that in a passenger airliner, you are probably safer flying 200 miles an hour versus flying at 400 miles an hour? 
yeah, like there's less turbulence, shit wiggles less, there are fewer mechanical forces on the plane, but how much less? Because you know you're going to get to your destination two times longer it's going to take you. How much are you reducing the risk of something uh, calamitous happening to the airplane? Jesus Christ, by some teeny tiny fraction of a teeny tiny fraction of a percent. So the SFR of getting to your journey on time by minimizing risk, it's just not worth it to go super slow. Same idea with driving your car. Do you ever just drive down the street at 10 miles an hour and people are passing you and honking like, fuck you, speed up, go to hell. And you're like, oh, thanks, fellas, just trying to be safe. Well, there's a trade-off there. And yeah, even if you go 40 miles an hour, it's definitely less safe. But versus getting there fucking way, way, way slower, it might not be worth it. Last stupid analogy I'll use because I use this one a couple more times is if you have a fighter jet that can fly at 1,200 miles an hour potentially, and you just use it to cruise into battle where you are needed to support your other forces at like 230 miles an hour. The other guys in battle are like, bro, when are you here? You're like, I don't know, 30 minutes, fellas, I'll get there. Well, God damn it, hurry the fuck up. I know you can go faster without much of a risk or much of a downside. So step on the fucking gas, push that throttle, and God damn it, get over here. Push or pull, I don't know, on an airplane flies. In any case, yes, you will absolutely very much not risk high degree of muscle loss with a very small deficit, but the diet's going to take you forever needlessly. So you say, fuck it. Push the throttle. Let's fucking do this. And you go in the other direction. Another thought experiment. You crank up the calorie deficit to 750 calories daily. So instead of eating 2750 at a 3000 maintenance, you're now eating 2250. Dope. You're going to get a lot of fat loss fast, but your fatigue is also going to start to sum up quickly and quickly and quickly. And then once fatigue gets high enough, if you keep that up for a few weeks or even a few months, you're going to run into some problems. High levels of fatigue prevent the physical energy to do overloading and training. You did 300 pounds for six reps last time in the bench. This time you need 300 pounds for four, and that's all you can do. Is that an overload? Not much, not the best. It would have been great if you could do 300 for seven reps, but you were on a huge deficit, so you got weaker. Some of that's just from the proximate fatigue, but if you can't overload consistently like that, after some number of weeks, you absolutely risk losing muscle, 100%. In addition, high levels of fatigue at a biochemical level through processes like the AMPK signaling mechanism can actually turn down your anabolic signaling, turn your catabolic signaling up, and at a biochemical level, even if you feel hunky-dory, can cause muscle loss or prevent muscle gain. And when you're in a big deficit, you need some muscle gain to go under the hood because that gets canceled out by the muscle loss, and then hopefully you're at neutral. But if you've got a crap load of fatigue, you might not be in neutral anymore. Now you're losing muscle. And lastly, if you really crank it for a while, your sympathetic fight or flight nervous system starts to overexpress itself and your parasympathetic relaxation and recovery nervous system component starts to express itself less. That throws you off and then the hormonal and sort of neurophysiological environment that causes starts to also be conducive to making you even weaker and stall muscle growth because one thing that happens if you do this long enough is your cortisol goes up, your testosterone goes down. The last I checked, I Googled those hormones and Wikipedia says that, you know, you're going to be losing some muscle if cortisol goes way up and testosterone goes way down. You don't go see your doctor. He's like, good news, Frank, cortisol sky high and your test is undetectable. They're like, oh, watch out wife. Am I right, doc? And he's like, oh, go get her. Go get her, son. My man. Nope. That's the opposite of what you want. So yeah, 750K calorie deficit. And the, and the fighter jet analogy is like throwing the afterburners on, but then there's just on all the time. Oh, you'll go real fast, but not for long because you'll either burn all of your fuel or you'll burn the engines out and then you're not doing shit after that anymore. You need a lot of maintenance, a lot of downtime. If you think you want to diet really quickly and just get the results, please consider this Thomas Sowellian uh, phrase I'm about to use here. You are not even among the first million or maybe billion people to think, oh, I'll just get it done quick and get out. These things have a dedicated series of processes that if you push it too fast, you could end up, well, just losing a bunch of muscle. Then you come into the office after a three-month diet and you're like, ladies, what do you guys think of my new me? And they're like, oh my God, I'm so happy that you recovered from that terrible disease that you must have been sick with because you look really fucked up. God damn.
damn it. At least maybe I could get some some sympathy play for being sick. Scott the video guy, do you think that works in the, in the office? A little corporate liaison, a little making partner, a little like, oh yeah, I was so sick. You know, I could I thought at times I would just never live again, but I, I could maybe I could learn to love. I don't know if that works or not. I think Women want a real man. It's 2023. That's bullshit. <laughs> All right. So TLDR, anything under 250 calorie deficit, anything less than that, uh, maybe not an ideal stimulus to fatigue ratio, not an ideal amount of fat lost versus muscle lost. Anything greater, at least consistently for seven uh, than 750 kcal is like a bit much. Great fat loss for a time and then really high muscle loss eventually, and that throws it all off. Between those two, depending on the context, depending on the way you do it, there probably aren't a ton of wrong answers. So something like a 500 kilocalorie deficit per day, plus or minus a little bit, is kind of really awesome and is going to be if long-term your goal is to lose a lot of fat while minimizing muscle loss and you don't want it to take forever, something like a 500 kilocalorie deficit per day is a real swell idea on average, something like it, not necessarily it itself. And that's roughly corresponding to something like a pound of tissue lost, probably all of it fat, per week. So if you look at a diet someone put together and they're really interested in not losing any muscle and they're trying to lose more than about a pound per week consistently, you got to tell them, ooh, look, if it's, a, it's 1.25 pounds, if they're doing a 12-week diet and they want to lose 14 or 15 pounds or something, yeah, it's probably fine. But if they're doing a 12-week diet and they're like, I'm going to lose 24 pounds, you're like, all right, maybe that's a good idea. But in many circumstances, unless you're really big and have lots of fat tissue, that might not be the smartest thing in the world. Now, it's tough to figure out your expenditure all the time. So you don't know what calorie deficit you're in. So if you set yourself up a good diet and lose roughly a pound per week, then you're pretty good to go. No wrong answers there. But there's another way to do it, which really takes into account recovery dynamics and is kind of cool. So I'll share this kind of more advanced way. You don't have to do it this way. You can just get right around a 500 calorie deficit and just run that motherfucker into the ground. Many bodybuilding coaches have looked at glycogen fill in the muscles as a really good indicator of the level of fatigue diet fatigue that that bodybuilder has been subjected to. So it looks like this. When you're not in a deficit, when you're well-fed, your muscles are nice and full with glycogen. They look rounder. You get great pumps. Your muscles feel tight under the skin. Amazing. But enough days in a pretty gnarly deficit, and especially a bigger deficit, you're going to start to look flatter and flatter and flatter until you look flattened out, which means your muscles kind of look stringier than normal. Pumps are really difficult to get. If you've been around the sport for a while, or if you just looked at a lot of boys training in the gym, like I've both done both of those things, then it's pretty obvious to the trained eye, especially if you see someone like your client regularly, or you see yourself regularly in the mirror, you know when you're fucking full and you know when you're not fucking full. So what do you do? What do you get when PhD sports scientists collaborate with pro bodybuilders? The most effective muscle growth training app ever made. Get yours now. You run a deficit, a pretty gnarly one even. Once you flattened out and you have been flat for something like three to seven days, depending on how hard you want to push it and how much fatigue you want to risk generating and before you pull back, between three and seven days-ish in my estimate, which really like much better said, these aren't precise numbers, half a week to a week of being very flat, any more than that, and, and you're probably into that excessive catabolic muscle destroying or muscle burning drive. You want to shut that shit down. So then you go into maintenance mode or even better, a slight hypercaloric mode, maybe a 250 kcal surplus, and that surplus should be composed of lots and lots of carbohydrate. You take a few days maybe three days, maybe five or six days and refill. And now you're fucking full and tight again, muscles burst and everything's looking fucking great. And after you've refilled, your fatigue is way down. Everything's hunky-dory. You're back into a very great SFR. 
you can begin another push, another drive into depletion. It might take a week or longer for you to get flat and then another three to seven days to confirm, okay, I've been flat for long enough. And then you repeat that carb up and you do these multiple cycles throughout your fat loss diet that takes a few months. And during that time, you burn a crap load of fat. You burn probably very little muscle because every time you get way too much fatigue and muscle risk risk starts to go back up, you start refeeding for a few days, get the carbs back in there. You'll probably grow a little muscle during that time, getting back what you lost more than likely, or even grow a little bit of net muscle. Over the long term, it takes some time to get in shape that way, but you end up having a lot of the best of all worlds. This is how I'm inclined to understand the vast majority of champion bodybuilders do it. It manages fatigue super well because it has distinct, very low fatigue periods where you're eating more than you need. And it encourages, on average, staying between a 250 kcal and 750 kcal deficit. Even if all of your deficit days are 750 kcal, you have surplus days of 250 plus to balance that out. And then the average still ends up being about 500. It saves the maximum muscle, if not even building some muscle, and it burns loads of fat. So if you want to just get skinny, fuck it. Cut the deficit into the fucking teeth. You'll get skinny like I did at my last bodybuilding show and fuck that all up. But if you're not an idiot like I'm an idiot, then you'll try to do the cycling method or just stick to roughly a 500 kilocalorie deficit on average, and then you'll have very happy fun times. And then you'll just be walking in the mall with your new body, and you'll like... Uh, see like a crowd of really hip people of your age just kind of hobnobbing and they all know each other but they don't know you and you walk up to them and you're just like hey hey guys and they're like oh my god get in here be our friend you're great that's it you made it see you next time